Our next demo up is by the head chef and marketing manager for Breville Commercial. It's responsible for creating the vast majority of their cooking content and is someone who is able to explain the products in great depth from multiple perspectives and package it in a way that's beautiful, inspirational, and educational. He's also a newly inducted member of the sous vide hall of fame. So please help me welcome chef David Petranzik. Hey buddy. Thanks for having me. All right. So I think we're just going to jump into it because uh, when I asked, when I asked Mike and Jason, well, how long should the, should the uh, session be? He said, oh, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. And I said, well, how about 45? Uh, so I'm going to try to stick to the script and we're going to get through this. Uh, but hopefully you guys learned something. So what are we going to talk about? So we are going to do, um, we're going to do sous vide cocktails. And let me see here, Mike, Jason, how do I, I can turn my stuff off, but how do I share? Am I, do I have sharing enabled? might need to do that or mike do you know off the top of your head do you have those videos or is uh dave sharing those you can either type in any of the chats we're on or uh <laughs> i don't have uh i don't have a share icon anywhere. Uh, i think he's sending you another link to get you in send you another one sorry yeah. over email Okay. Be back in a second. Ninety seconds. You want me to do a little dance? <laughs> uh, if there's any other questions you want me to uh, spitball on while uh, we get this sorted out, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'm always happy to talk about pretty much any of the aspects of what we've been talking about. Um, and I, uh, I think the the pasteurization is one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and the ability to hold food. I mentioned it for parties, and I didn't want to dive in too much because we had the schedule. But with uh, Dave popping in a new one, it is something that's huge. I will cook chicken breasts ahead of time, and then I can just uh, chill them down in an ice bath, put them in the free in the in the fridge, and then when people come over in a few days, I can you know easily grill chicken breasts or ribs are perfect. Um, you can cook at one fifty for. Uh, 24 hours, chill them down. And when people come over, you can uh, throw them on the smoker and it takes, you know, 15, 20 minutes to get back to temperature and you have like great ribs and what it's things that uh, really uh, everyone loves. And it seems like you've been slaving by the, the smoker or by the grill all day. And you've really just, you know, been relaxing and making sure the cocktails are good. Uh, Lloyd want to know what my day job is. So for about the last decade, I've been doing uh, sous vide cooking, uh, writing cookbooks. I have uh, 15 of them out now running amazingfoodmadeeasy.com. And recently I got back into uh, computer programming. That's what I did uh, in my previous life before doing cooking. So I've been uh, working at a, a startup and enjoying some of those aspects of getting back into one of my passions of uh, web development and computer programming. Uh, Colby asked what the minimum pasteurization temp is, that there's lots of conflicting information. And I will let uh, Lloyd, Kevin, and Darren go at it in the comments because they always have fun about whether it's 122, 125, or 127. But um, in general, I try to cook above 127 or 130 if I'm going to be pasteurizing just to make sure uh, my circulator is precise, which I'm sure it is because it's poly, it's a Breville commercial uh, circulator. So I have confidence in it, but it gives me a little bit of leeway. And so I, uh, I usually go above 130, but that's just for safety reasons. And uh, I like my steaks at 130. So that also makes it easier for me to not push it. So I think we got uh, Chef Petransic back up here. Are you uh, ready to rock and roll, Chef? You are gonna party. Awesome. All right. So uh, sorry about that, folks. So we got, it seems like we've got it all taken care of. Um, all right, so let me share my screen. Cool. So what are we going to do today? So we're going to do uh, problem solving of classic cocktails. Uh, I, when I talk with Mike and Jason about you know, what I want to do for these things, it's, it's anything but me. Uh, there's so many great people to cover uh, that stuff, like Stefan, like Jason. Uh, there's so many other people who can handle that uh, well. Um, I'll be doing vegetables tomorrow. And I said, well, what else can I do? And I really wanted to uh, uh, challenge myself and do cocktails. Cocktails is something that I absolutely love, and it's something that I've really taken into uh, taken a deep dive on uh, recently. So let's go to the next one. So what's what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? So infusion of alcohol typically takes 
a lot of time. And bartenders use time to macerate ingredients and then extract their flavors. You can see here, this is a, a device called the porthole. It's a device uh, that was created by Crucial Detail for service at Alinea Restaurant in Aviary. And uh, this, this device, basically, you put um, aromatics, ingredients in, and then over a function of time, over the course of your beverage, it changes and you get these different results. And um, when I was talking to one of the servers at Aviary, he was saying, well, this is the most challenging cocktail that we have to prepare because uh, if, we, if you taste it at five minutes, it tastes different than it does at 10 minutes, at 15 minutes, and 20 minutes. And then as, so as the, you have the drink, it evolves. That's cool in that setting, but if I'm trying to get a repeatable exact result, that's not okay. Uh, and so this method of macerating uh, in ingredients in alcohol, uh, while it works, um, it produces a super inconsistent result. And for certain things, it can take way, it just takes way too long, uh, in some cases days. And then you still have that uh, unpredictable uh, result. So what's the solution? Uh, then the solution is to cook your ingredients uh, sous vide and this will allow you to maintain the sparkle uh, of ingredients. And I use that word, um, I you often associate it with limes. If you use pre-juiced lime juice, it's really sad. Uh, but if you juice a lime fresh for your cocktail, it really has sparkle, it's alive. And being able to do your infusion sous vide at a very precise low temperature uh, retains that retains that integrity. Now, I didn't. Uh, I was not the one who figured this out. Um, Alex Day, who is an amazing bartender, you guys should check out the book uh, Cocktail Codex. Uh, it goes way further um, into this topic. Uh, but Alex Day and his team at Death and Co. Uh, sort of figured this out. So what do they do? They they split their infusions into delicate and hearty. And they do delicate infusions at 57C and hearty infusions at 63C for two hours, pretty much across the board. And the possibilities are really endless what you can do. Uh, we did uh, for, I think, a VIP ISBA cocktail hour or something like that. We did a, I did a coffee sweet vermouth where we made a Boulevardier. We also made a Manhattan. Um, and then a couple years ago, I think for the first um, virtual sous vide summit, I did a toasted coconut, uh, a toasted coconut mai tai, uh, where we infused uh, rum with toasted coconut, uh, banana bourbon. That is a big one that we do almost at every trade show that Poly Science does. I do this uh, drink called the Carmen Miranda, um, and it is a banana infused bourbon with spices. It's really delicious. Uh, I know Richard Jensen, Richard, if you're here, shout out to you. I know you've done uh, cocoa nib infusions and stuff like that, uh, and there are like vanilla cognac. So you can, sous vide uh, allows you to buy these uh, amazing spirits and then put your own stamp on them and do, you know, create your own flavor profiles. So with that, I think we're going to go into the first video uh, on infusion of vodka and raspberries. Uh, let's see here. Mike, I'm going to stop sharing. Here we have our ingredients for our raspberry cross section. So I have raspberries that are whole, raspberries that have been sliced in half, and then raspberries that we're going to muddle. And by muddle, what we're going to do is we're going to place them in the bag and just kind of mash them up with our hands. We're not going to go crazy. We're not trying to make raspberry jelly here, but we are going to just muddle them up a bit, right? So, and in these bags, I have uh, 115 grams of vodka, uh, to match 115 grams of raspberry in all of these containers. So we're going to cook them at both 53, sorry, 57 and 63 degrees Celsius across whole, sliced, and muddled. And there's equal parts raspberry to vodka. I'm going to get these bagged up and then we're going to muddle those raspberries. So I've bagged up our raspberries and again we have whole sliced and muddled and what you can see from our sliced berries is they're already starting to give up a little bit of the color that's probably going to hint towards what our end result will be but uh, we'll see and so for the muddled berries we're just going to go in here and give like a a good squish and i call that muddled okay i'm going to do this again now i'm squeezing them and i'm giving them a good squeeze to break them up 
but I'm not like pounding on them or anything like that. We still want to be able to strain this off pretty easily. So, so muddled, sliced, and whole are going to go down at one hour at 57 and 63 degrees, uh, respectively. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. So let me go back to sharing my window. Okay. So, um, so what do these, what do these taste like? And so, uh, I actually tasted the, through these in video and it was just way too long. So I was like, you know, I'm going to make the slide and we'll talk through it this way. Um, so you see here our whole sliced and muddled. Okay. And then we have our 57 degrees Celsius working, uh, across the uh, top line and then the 63 degrees Celsius across the bottom line. And what was really wild about these, and you can, if I had showed the video, you would see the expressions on my face, but the remarkable difference uh, in each one of these. Uh, so starting with uh, 57 uh, Celsius, we had very high clarity, um, and it was, it was a bright and fresh raspberry flavor. When we went to sliced, it was like double the flavor. It was just a whole, a whole notch more flavorful of raspberry. The muddled had lower clarity, much lower clarity. There was visible particulate in it. I would definitely strain that out in the in the experiment. I just dumped it into a into a, a glass. But um, if I were going to use it, you'd have to strain it, in my opinion. Uh, but again, another another notch in flavor. Sixty three uh, sixty three whole. Wow, that was awesome. Uh, it was jammy. It was rich. It was super clear. Uh, you could use that right out of the bag. That, in my opinion, was was the winner. Was the winner. Uh, for here, I think the uh, flavor started to kind of plateau at the at the sixty three and sliced. It could have been uh, just my palate at that point, but um, I, it seemed like the flavor started to kind of. We we were having uh, uh, marginal returns at that point, and then muddled in my opinion 63 muddled was unusable it was super full of particulate i strained it and it was still just like kind of cloudy and not great and may, again could have just been my palate but there was, seemed to be some sort of an off flavor that had kind of developed um and i i just i didn't enjoy it so uh the winner uh of this of this was the 63 hole but you can do this the point of this exercise you can do this with anything you can do this with raspberries, you could do this with peaches, you could do it with apricots, you could do it with blueberries, you could do it with whatever the heck you want as far as fruit or um, aromatics, and you could also do it, um, you could also do it with whatever spirit you want. It doesn't have to be vodka, it could be gin, it could be rum, it could be bourbon, it could be whatever you want. Uh, the possibilities with this are endless, but now you've got the toolkit um, using 57 degrees Celsius, 63 degrees Celsius, and then determining how much surface area you want to expose. Do you want to use whole cinnamon sticks? Do you want to crack the cinnamon sticks? Do you want to toast the cinnamon sticks? So you really, with this process, you can really dial in your flavors. So going back to the original method of infusion, where it's, we're going to put ingredients and spirit, let it sit. This just blows that out of the water and, and really just opens up the, uh, the toolkit of what's possible. So, Moving on to the next. So another problem. <laughs> so the problem is you can't really cook uh, alcohol sous vide uh, above 78 degrees because the bags will explode. Now, I've been cooking sous vide for a very long time. I started cooking sous vide in 2000, uh, 2007, and I have never had an exploding bag. Never have I ever had an exploding bag. I promise you, wouldn't lie to you. And uh, <laughs> um, I said, I'm going to myth bust this. And then uh, as you'll see in our video here, I, I had some learnings. So uh, let's start talking about proof. So what is proof? Proof is a measure of the alcohol content in a spirit. Proof is equal to double your ABV. Your highest theoretical proof is 200. Um, Everclear is uh, labeled at 190 uh, proof because when you take the cap off, it actually loses a little bit of uh, alcohol content, just ambient. Um, and I said, well, you know what, I'm going to torture test this theory. And if there's anything that's going to go full nuclear in a bag, it's going to be ever clear at 90 degrees Celsius. So let's see what happens. Mike, I'm going to hand All it right. over to you. So All right. here so. is ever clear. This is 190 proof grain spirit. And if anything is going to explode in the sous vide bath, it's going to be this. So we're going to fill this sous vide bag up, see if it explodes. I'm not going to do 
specific measurement, just going for a couple glugs. That seems like a reasonable amount for some sort of an infusion, whether it's bitters, uh, a tincture, uh, fortifying some something. Uh, that looks, yeah, that looks appropriate. So we're going to get this sealed up, throw it in a sous vide bath at 90 degrees Celsius and see if it explodes. We'll check back in later. So what we could see very quickly is that our bag inflates. And as it's sitting here and cooling, it's actually compressing back down. And the reason for this is because the uh, vapor from the uh, uh, from the spirit or the liquid from the Everclear is going is going vapor phase, and actually actually do we see we don't see any leaks no leaks no pops but we do definitely see it inflate. So let's throw it back in the bath and see if it explodes. <laughs> yes. Okay, what we have here is a failed bag. Uh, because there was no more room for the uh, Everclear to go vapor phase, the bag popped and it failed quite spectacularly, I'll add. Uh, you've got a solid, a solid quarter inch uh, all the way around this bag. It didn't fail at, uh, at the seal. Well, actually, it looks like some of the seal failed, but uh, it was actually the side of the bag that blue which that's impressive that is a it went through a quarter inch of uh of material uh but we also have some failure along the seal as well but so what do we learn from this well keep your keep your infusions below the uh boiling point of alcohol and uh you're not going to have any problems any higher it's going to end up in your bath not in your belly Yeah, so learnings to be had. Let me uh, go back to sharing here. All right, so what's next? So I absolutely love mint juleps. They're one of my favorite things. Um, but mint is a particularly uh, difficult ingredient to work with uh, because uh, when you start to muddle it uh, to extract its flavor, it bruises the herb and that releases polyphenol oxidase, which is what causes it to brown and oxidize. Uh, and that quickly equates to oxidized flavors and aromas in your drink. Dave Arnold solved the problem uh, by freezing uh, the herb in uh, liquid nitrogen before blending it. Uh, but what if you don't? What if you don't have liquid nitrogen? Well, he also developed a, a technique he calls blender muddling, which is basically the same, um, uh, but it still has a, a short shelf life. You've got like 15 minutes before uh, that starts to lose its flavor. So how can we uh, extract these flavors from the mint, uh, but have a bit more of a shelf life? So let's take a look at uh, mint syrup sous vide. So we're gonna make our mint syrup. And what I've got here is 150 grams of water and 150 grams of sugar to make simple syrup. We're not gonna heat it, we're just gonna blend it. And then we're gonna go ahead and add our mint to that and we're gonna bag it up. Now, the reason that I'm going to blend the simple syrup uh, to get the sugar to dissolve is that I don't want it to be doing that in the bath. I want to go in with syrup and the mint so we can make the infusion and then get it chilled down quickly. Okay, so we're going to add our water and sugar to the blender. Water goes in and please don't buy simple syrup. This is the easiest thing in the world to make. It's just water, sugar and equal parts. And then you're going to blend it for one minute until it's fully dissolved. If you need to uh, blend it a little bit more to get it to continue to dissolve, you can do that, but you don't need to heat it. If you heat it up, you got to cool it back down. And why bother with that? You don't, uh, you don't have to whisk you know, lemonade or heat lemonade or anything, right? You just whisk it until it's dissolved. 
We're going to do the same thing. Here we go. All right, so we've got our simple slayer up here, and that just blended for one minute. We're going to go ahead and just put this into our deli container for the moment. Okay. Put our pitcher off to the side here. So I have 25 grams of mint, and to begin expressing the oils from the mint, we're just going to give it a nice slap. Oh, and that just begins to release those oils from the mint. Oh, it smells so freaking good. I love the smell of fresh mint. And we're going to keep that bright, oh, that bright, fresh, minty aroma by cooking it low temperature sous vide. So this is going to go into our bag. Our cook time on this is going to be 20 minutes at 57 degrees Celsius. So I've got, again, 25 grams of mint. 150 grams each sugar and water to make a simple syrup. That's going to go in. And we're going to bag this up and get it cooking. Okay, so we've got our mint syrup that was cooked at uh, 57 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. And we cooled it down in an ice bath and then strain it off. And you can just see here from the, from the color, it is super beautiful, it is bright green, it is not a dull green, uh, and it has all of the bright flavors and aromas of, of mint. It basically tastes like spearmint gum. It is awesome. So to build our, our mint julep here, we're gonna do two and a half ounces of 100 proof bourbon. You could use a bonded bourbon. Uh, this is 100 proof. Uh, we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of the mint syrup. And this is just a dash of uh, Peychaud's bitters because I say so, because I like it. It's not traditional for a, for a mint julep, but I like it. So we're going to grab our ice. And for this, I am using nugget ice. Uh, if you have a Sonic nearby, awesome. They sell ice. This is from uh, Chick-fil-A there nearby. Just going to crack some of that up. All right, so in we go with one dash pango, ingo, uh, not Angostura, Peychaud's bitters. That was a scant two dashes to make one dash. We're going to do three quarters of an ounce of the mint syrup. And then we're gonna do two ounces of 100 proof bourbon. All right, now once all of this is in here, I like to, I like to start my mint julep by giving it a little bit of a swizzle, just to kind of get things mixing a little bit. And now we're gonna go in bit by bit with our nugget ice. So we're gonna put a little bit in and we're going to swizzle some more. And you're going to see the glass start to frost. Now we're going to add more nugget ice. We're going to swizzle a little bit more. Okay, and now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and add my mint because if I wait to add my mint when I have my full amount of ice in there, I'm not going to be able to add it in. It's just going to be hard to deal with. So we're going to add our mint at this point. And I've got a lively bunch of mint here. I'm going to give it a slap to release those oils. I'm going to press this down into my cup. we want to go, you kind of want to build it, build it nice, tall, plentiful, 
should have like a, a snow cone of ice on top. We'll pack that in there so it stays nice and cold. We're going to add our straw and we're going to add it in the back near the mint so that when we take a sip, our senses are informed by the mint as well. But uh, that is sous vide mint julep. Let's give it a taste. That's freaking awesome. It tastes like bourbon meets spearmint in the best way possible. Uh, it's bright, it's aromatic, and it's super delicious. So sous vide saves the day once again. And yes, that was a delicious, tasty beverage. We're going to make more delicious, tasty beverages. So uh, let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it moving. Ooh. So the cocktail, and uh, I believe in the handouts uh, column, Mike has already saved uh, the uh, or dropped the PDF of the recipes for all of the cocktails. But if anybody wants to just grab a quick screen grab, uh, you can absolutely do that. So I'll just wait a second. Cool. So, cordials. Whoops. Move this over. Okay, so cordials. So, first, what's a cordial? Cordial is oleosaccharum, citrus juice, and citric acid. More or less. What is oleosaccharum? Oleosaccharum is a combination of sugar, of sugar and, uh, and essential oils from citrus peel in most cases. Sugar is hygroscopic, so it will pull uh, it will pull the oil from the peels. So the way that you typically make oleosaccharum is that you take your peels off of your citrus, whether it's lime, lemon, uh, orange, grapefruit, what have you. You muddle them with sugar, uh, start expressing those oils, and the sugar will take care of the rest of the work. And honestly, you don't even really have to muddle it. The sugar will do its job. The problem is it takes too long. It takes 24 to 48 hours uh, to make oleosaccharum. Uh, sous vide allows us to do that much, much faster. Now, uh, talking about cordials, you can make all sorts of different cordials. Uh, here, so we say oleosaccharum, so we're, you, I, I was referencing citrus peel, but it doesn't have to be. You could take blueberries, uh, sprinkle some sugar on them, let that, that extract the juice um, from, the, uh, from, the, from the blueberry, and then add some citric acid to it. So you could do this uh, with apples, you could do it with all sorts of things. Um, and it would still be, you know, cordial. And uh, you can do different acid types depending on wh what uh, sort of flavor profile you're going for, and you can alter the flavor profile by using different acids. So citric acid is made from citrus. You can use it in uh, citrus um, cordials. Malic acid, it's made from grapes. You can use that in uh, fruity cordials. And, or tartaric acid, uh, which is made from apples, and uh, it's a little bit fruity, but a little bit more crisp, if you will, uh, and you could use that um, if you want a little bit more uh, bite to your cordial. So what's the solution? So cooking, cooking it uh, sous vide extracts those essential oils much, much faster, uh, but also maintains the integrity uh, of those flavors by cooking it at a low temperature. Mike, let's, uh, let's move on to the grapefruit video. All right, so we're gonna make the grapefruit cordial. And what I've got here is 250 grams of sugar, 250 grams of grapefruit juice, uh, 10 grams of grapefruit zest, which I have zested and placed into the juice. And the reason that I did that was so that it didn't dry out. If you go ahead and uh, zest it on a microplane, you're gonna end up with a very fine zest, uh, very oily, but it'll dry out very quickly. So to keep all of those uh, oils where we want them, I, I zested it and then went straight into the juice with it. We also have uh, two and a half grams of citric acid, and the amount of acid would depend on the type of acid that you're using, but also the acidity of the fruit you're using. For this, we're gonna go with uh, two and a half grams of citric acid to 250 grams of grapefruit juice in an equal part of grapefruit juice to the sugar, 250 grams of each, uh, and then uh, 10 grams grapefruit zest. So we're gonna bag all of this up and this is going to cook at 57 degrees Celsius for two hours to make our grapefruit cordial. So I'm going to bag that up and get that in the bath. So our, so our grapefruit cordial is out of the bath, uh, cooked at 57 degrees Celsius. Let's give it a taste. It 
It tastes like a grapefruit sour patch kid. That is awesome. It's it's so punchy grapefruit, but it's got a nice sweetness and it also has like a really nice body to it. Um, so the cocktail we're gonna do is kind of like a classic gin gimlet, uh, except instead of doing a lime cordial, we're gonna do a grapefruit cordial. So grapefruit cordial, uh, sugar, zest, citric acid, and juice. Uh, and you can make cordials out of pretty much any fruit. Um, and then play with, uh, play with the acids to kind of, uh, change it up a bit. Um, but again, uh, 10 grams of grapefruit zest, two and a half grams of citric acid, 250 grams of sugar and 250 grams fresh grapefruit juice. Let's go into it. Uh, so we're going to do two ounces of a citrus forward gin. I'm going to use Plymouth gin. Uh, what's the proof on this? Uh, 41.2 times two is 86 proof, 80, 80, 80 and change proof. Close enough for government work. So we're going to do two ounces of this gin. The point is it's not Navy strength gin. It's just a, their standard strength gin. Uh, but this one has like a nice uh, citrus forward quality to it. So that's why we're going to go with that. Kind of play nice with the uh, grapefruit cordial. So we did two ounces of that. We're going to do one ounce of the uh, grapefruit cordial. That is pretty much that. So we're gonna go in with our ice into our cheater tin. So a cheater tin, basically just kind of want to fill it up almost to the top. And that's how we know how much to use. Slap it on, we're gonna give it a nice hard shake. Gonna pour it up. So we're using a, a really fine strainer, and then we're also gonna go. We're gonna double strain. We're also gonna go through a mesh strainer. Any ice chips that uh, could have uh, come off of the ice, uh, we don't want them in the drink. We want a nice textured drink, so we're gonna double strain this. There's always some left in your cheater tin. It's like the angel's share. All right, classic gin gimlet. This one with grapefruit. Give it a taste. You smell grapefruit right away. Yeah, it's just pretty much fresh grapefruit. Anybody who doesn't like gin, make them try this drink. The gin is perfectly in balance. It's not a London dry. It's not very juniper forward. Uh, Plymouth is very uh, citrus forward. Perfectly balanced with the amount of sweetness from the cordial and also the acidity from the cordial. Classic gin gimlet, but with grapefruit. And damn if that wasn't a tasty gimlet. But we have more wonderful cocktails, so let's let's keep going. So, uh, grapefruit gimlet. If anybody wants to take a screen grab, but again, uh, in the handouts uh, tab, uh, Mike has dropped the PDF of all of the cocktails that we're doing during this session. So, gum syrup. So, what's gum Arabic? It comes from uh, tree sap traditionally. There's artificial gums. Uh, now, but it's to, it's basically used as a thickener. It adds viscosity, and it can also prevent crystallization in higher sugar concentrations, which is why uh, people sneak it into two to one syrups. Not sneak it in, but use it in uh, two to one syrups to prevent crystallization uh, while it's while it's under refrigeration. So gum arabic takes a while to to fully hydrate. It takes about 24 hours. So the way that you would typically make a gum syrup, especially if you were working uh with a fresh citrus juice or something like that to preserve uh those aromatics in that flavor is to just let it sit on the counter and let it take its time and hydrate but that sucks it takes too damn long uh so through through the power of sous vide uh, we're gonna make it much 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 faster and also be able to pre uh preserve 
uh, the flavor of the pineapple. Uh, so you can use gum syrups in a, in a variety of cocktails to um, enhance the texture of your body. And I would strongly urge you to start adding uh, some gum arabic using this method uh, to your two to one demerara syrup and use that in an old fashioned. And make that side by side with a regular old fashioned, you're never gonna look back, trust me. Mike, let's take it away. So what we've got here is pineapple gum syrup. We've got 250 grams of freshly juiced pineapple juice. We have 250 grams of sugar, 15 grams of gum arabic, and one and a half grams of citric acid powder. Uh, again, so we have equal parts of the grape of the pineapple juice to the sugar, and then we're going to thicken it up with the gum arabic, and we're just going to balance out the sweetness of the sugar and the fresh pineapple juice by adding just a little bit of citric acid powder to it. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, dry blend in our gum arabic to the sugar, and we're also going to add our citric acid. And we're just going to dry blend this and that will prevent, that will help with dispersion and prevent it from clogging when it gets into the blender. So we're just going to mix this up. Okay. And we're going to throw this into the blender pitcher. And we're going to add the wet to the dry in this case. So we're gonna get this moving in the blender and we're gonna add in the pineapple, uh, the fresh pineapple juice. We'll turn it on low, just to sort of get it moving. And we'll go in with our pineapple juice. And that's it. So we're gonna go ahead and get this bagged up. This is gonna cook at 63 degrees Celsius for two hours. All right, so the uh, pineapple gum syrup is finished. Uh, it is full bodied and luscious and amazing from that gum arabic. And the thing about it is that the pineapple juice is so sweet, you don't wanna add extra sugar to it to get that, uh, to get that body. So we're adding the gum arabic to increase the texture, increase the mouthfeel. Pineapple already has an amazing silky, smoothy, sexy mouthfeel on cocktails, and this one just brings it over to the top. Uh, so, what are we gonna do here? We're gonna do an ounce of brandy. Uh, this recipe actually calls for cognac, cognac and brandy, same, same thing more or less. Uh, so we're gonna go in with an ounce of this. This is Copper King's cognac brandy, one ounce. Okay, we're gonna do one ounce of Jamaican rum. This one is a, a pot still rum. This is Hamilton uh, Jamaican pot still. So delicious, lots of funk, lots of banana funk on this one. Uh, you could use Appleton, you could use Karuba. Um, any Jamaican rum would do, Plantation, Jamaica, uh, also amazing, but we're gonna go with Hamilton uh, pot still Jamaica for a lot of those big funky tones. One ounce. Uh, on the citrus here, we're gonna go with lime and we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce. Wow, I'm <laughs> smelling the Hamilton. I'm smelling those tones. Uh, and then on the pineapple gum syrup, we're gonna do half an ounce. Half ounce pineapple gum syrup. You can just see the viscosity. And we're gonna do one dash of Angostura bitters. So this is uh, Ned King's recipe. 
we're going to give it one more shake. Uh, this is Ned King's re recipe. The original recipe dates back to the 1890s. Uh, Ned King at his bar Gigantic in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Uh, this is where he popularized the drink. And uh, his addition to the whole thing was uh, removing some of the what he felt was superfluous ingredients and adding in the Angostura bitters. And uh, here we are just uh, perfecting on the pineapple gum syrup by using the sous vide technique. So uh, we're going to grab our ice and shake it up. All right, going to use our cheater tin. Fill it pretty much all the way. And we are going to give this one a nice hard shake to really, really use that pineapple and that gum syrup to really just build a nice aerated body to this cocktail. Here we go. A nice hard shake for about 10 to 13 seconds. Strain into our coop. Double strain into our coop. See a lot of nice little bubble structure in there. I'm going to go back to our cheater tin because there's always a little left in there. All right, the gem. Let's do it. Woo! You get everything. Cognac, Jamaican rum. You get the pineapple. You get, the, you get everything on the nose of this. That is an aggressive nose. I'm excited for it. Cheers, folks. Damn. That is tasty. Super tropical. You get the tiki feels. It's not a tiki drink. It is way pre. It is way pre tiki. Again, this the original drink back drink dates back to the 1890s. Tiki wasn't even around until the mid-1930s. Oh, wow. You get the lime. You get those Jamaican rum tones. You get cognac. And really here, the pineapple is really just present in the mouthfeel. Also, some of the... No, you actually, you get it on the palate, but the mouthfeel of this is just second to none. This is a, this is a fantastic cocktail. And I hope you guys try it. All right, let's uh, get back to Sharon here. Yes, and so uh, that drink was so delicious. Uh, you'll notice this photo is a little bit different <laughs> because it was so delicious. I drank the whole thing uh, without taking a picture of it. Uh, so grab one from the internet. This cocktail is really phenomenal, and um, I highly recommend that you try it. You can use a gum syrup and a bunch of other drinks. Uh, use it in a margarita. Um, use it in mm, so many other things. A daiquiri would be great in. Uh, so many things, but uh, definitely make this one. Uh, gum Arabic, you can find it. Uh, Modernist Pantry. Uh, I'm sure you can find it on uh, Amazon as well, uh, but definitely give this one a go. Okay, getting close to the tail end here. So warm drinks. Warm drinks are just more or less a pain. <laughs> so you don't want to heat them too high because the alcohol uh, will start to uh, evaporate off. Uh, wine is acidic and can be re reactive with your cookware. Uh, and so glug, uh, if you hold it warm in an open vessel, such as a pot, your house smells great, but your glug doesn't. Uh, and sort of this is a pain because how the heck do you heat something behind a bar? You have to have a burner there. Uh, and then what do you do when you get several orders at once? I've got one order coming up to coming up to temperature and I get two more ring in. Do I make the decision to dump more in and drop the temperature back down so I have to wait longer? Or do I bring that one all the way up, dump that off, and then put more in? It's just a pain. Service of warm drink service of warm drinks is just a pain. 
but not with sous vide. So what are we going to do here? We're going to do glug. Uh, forgive me, my pronunciation of my umlau is not good, <laughs> but it is a uh, it is a Scandinavian uh, mold wine, and I absolutely love to make it around the holidays because when I invite people over for the holidays, I really enjoy making uh, warm drinks, and I love to have it when they get to the house. It's cold outside. You get there, you hand somebody a warm drink. You're the best friend. Mike, let's do it. Okay, so what we've got here is our ingredients for the, for the glug. And so uh, we're going to get these into a sous vide bag. I've got 375 mils of red wine. So it's about a half bottle of a red wine. And you can use whatever you like. I happen to like Oregon Pinot. So that's what I've got here. And in an inexpensive bottle, you don't want to use, uh, you don't want to use your, your finest uh, wines for this. You're going to add a ton of spices and a ton of sugar. Any uh, new ones that was once there is probably going to be lost. So just go with something that uh, you want to drink. Uh, have on hand. You've got that extra half a bottle, something you want to drink. All right, uh, we're also going to go in with 175 mils of a ruby port. You can use whatever kind of port you want. Uh, I grabbed a ruby port, N nice uh, fruity tones. 175 mils ruby port. Now here, 87 mils of cognac, which is about three ounces. That's a, I know that's a weird one, so three ounces of that. And actually, the cognac is not cognac, it is a brandy. Same difference. Uh, here I've got some Demerara sugar. Now, the reason we're using Demerara sugar is kind of interesting. So in traditional glug recipes, uh, they take a sugar cone and light it on fire, and then it caramelizes uh, and gets put out by the, uh, by, the, by the wine. So here we're trying to mimic that caramelized flavor uh, by using uh, a sugar that has some of those caramelly tones. So we got uh, uh, Demerara sugar here. If you don't uh, have that on hand, turbinado sugar, you could use absolutely. It's a lot easier to find. Uh, I got Demerara sugar off Amazon. Uh, but again, turbinado sugar, you could use that. Uh, if you see sugar in the raw, you could use that as well. Uh, anything that's going to give you those uh, caramelly sugar tones. So I've got uh, 50 grams of Demerara sugar. I've got in here my spice blend. I have one cinnamon stick that's cracked. I've got two cardamom pods that have been crushed. I have four whole cloves as well. That all goes in. I also have 25 grams of raisins. That is a, about one box of sun-made raisins. Okay. And now we're also going to add two nice big orange swaths. And the reason I didn't do this ahead of time is I didn't want the, or, the orange peel to dry out. Uh, I want to take those oils and just put them straight into the liquid. So we're going to do two big orange swaths. So we're going to do a nice peel with our white peeler from top to bottom. Nice big orange swath like that. And I'm actually just going to express it in before dropping it in the bag. Let's do that again. All right, and there you have it. So that's our ingredients for our glug. This is gonna cook at 70 degrees Celsius for two hours. And then uh, we'll check back in with you. All right, so the glug has come out of the sous vide bath and we strained it. Now what you could do is just ice the sous vide bag uh, and then portion it into however many, si how however many ounce portions you would like and you can just let those float in a bath all night. They're gonna be totally fine. I would strain them so they don't continue to, uh, to infuse, but then you could have those portions just floating in a bag. Uh, or again, if you think that's a waste of sous vide bags, uh, or you just want to be conscious of your bag usage, you could certainly put it in a in a mason jar or in, in a in a bottle or something like that, and just let it sit in the bath. But uh, for me, I would do individual portions because that's that's just how I would do it. So I have a preheated cup here, and I just threw this uh, in the microwave for 40 seconds. I do that during the holidays. Uh, or when it gets to colder temperatures outside, even with dinner plates, I just throw them in the microwave for 40 seconds. Uh, just take the chill off of them. It'll keep your food hot longer and your drinks hot longer. So I've got a preheated cup here. I'm just going to go in with the glug. A uh, nice pour because this is delicious and I'm going to drink it. Uh, and so 
you don't have to do this, but again, if I was serving it, I'd, you know, I'd just make it nice for people. I'm gonna throw in a cinnamon stick, because that looks pretty, and a star anise pod, because that also looks pretty. If you really wanted to, you could uh, throw an orange zest uh, in it, but or again, it really doesn't need it. It's cooked for two hours with all of those aromatics, star anise, demerara sugar. Sorry, this did not cook with star anise, uh, but you certainly could put star anise in it if you would, if you want to. You could also add bl whole blanched almonds. That's um, that's that's very typical. Instead of raisins, you could do prunes. You could do dried cranberries. You could do dried cherries. The the inclusions that you could do for aromatics, uh, you know, is just the possibilities are endless. So let's let's give it a taste. That smells like Thanksgiving. That smells like the holidays. It's got all those holiday spices happening, red wine. You get cognac, you get the port. Surprisingly, like, I, like the port stands out to me. Let's give it a taste. Yeah, I am not a big wine drinker by any means. I do like Oregon Pinot, which we used here, so maybe that influences uh, why I enjoy this so much. Could be the could be the cognac, um, but hmm, yeah, this is something that if someone comes over and it's cold outside and you hand them this, you're the new best friend. This it's like a hug in a glass. It's like a red wine spiced holiday hug in a glass. It's just absolutely fantastic. So with that, let's get into the next one. All right, let's, uh, let's see. Mike, I think you got to stop sharing. I, there we go. All right. And last but not least, and thank you all for hanging in here with me. I know this is a Bit of a lengthy one, but by the comments, it seems that people are enjoying it. Uh, so we'll just continue with that. So uh, if anybody wants to grab a screen grab, you can do that. But this is the uh, the glug. And so milk and eggs, what a pain in the butt. Uh, so scorching milk over a flame is highly probable. Uh, having to do it a la minute, also not great. Um, and then traditional Tom and Jerry batter. Tom and Jerry is like a cousin eggnog. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's bigger, better, better brother. Um, it requires making a spiced egg yolk syrup, and then you whip egg whites separately and then fold it all back together. And I don't want to deal with any of that. <laughs> and so, um, so I said, well, let's just do it speed. because so we're going to get this really awesome, silky, sexy texture out of the, uh, out of the batter but then I can just keep it warm in an easy whip and I don't have to worry about folding and all of that hot mess. Uh, so we're gonna do that. And then uh, we also hold the milk uh, warm because well, I don't wanna have to heat it over an open flame or even, uh, yeah, I don't wanna he have to heat it up on the minute either. So let's do it. Mike, let's get into the last one. Thank you all for making it this far. Let's get into it and make a Tom and Jerry. So. What I've got here is three whole eggs, uh, 225 grams of uh, sugar, and then we have a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon and allspice, and then an eighth of a teaspoon of nutmeg and clove. Uh, we're gonna do a dash of Angostura bitters and, and half an ounce of uh, Jamaican rum. I'm gonna go with Karuba Dark here, but other uh, good substitutions would be Appleton Estate. Uh, you could use Plantation Jamaica, or any uh, uh, any Jamaican rum that you like, any dark Jamaican rum. You really want those caramely uh, tones in this cocktail. So, into our blender, we're gonna put three three whole eggs. Okay, I'm gonna do one healthy dash of Angostura bitters, and I've seen people from uh, the brand do this. A dash is substantial dash and I know that was like one and a half but I really like Angostura bitters my preference uh, we're gonna do half an ounce of Karuba dark half an ounce Karuba dark and now we're gonna go in with our spices but before I go in with the spices I'm actually gonna mix a little bit of sugar into the spices and doing that is gonna allow them to disperse in the sugar 
and I'm, it's going to help me get all the spices out of, out of our container here. So in with our sugary spice mixture, we're going to add a little bit, get it moving, and then we'll add the rest of it. Second half of the sugar spice mix. And that's all you need to do. Just want to break up the eggs and make sure everything's incorporated. That smells phenomenal. This is going to go into a sous vide bag and it is going to cook at 70 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Uh, before going into an ISI charger. So let's, uh, let's get this cooking. Okay, so our Tom and Jerry batter mixture is down in the sous vide bath, and I've got six ounce portions of whole milk here. You could use warm water, but it's the holidays. Why even bother? Just, just go for the gold, right? So I've got six ounce portions of whole milk, and what you could do with these is keep them, keep them cold, and then as you're serving them, you could throw them into a sous vide bath for a couple of minutes and heat them back up. Uh, but since you can also just leave them float and they're gonna be totally fine, that's what I'm gonna do, because I don't have to worry about it. So I've got a couple bags here, I'm just gonna let these uh, swim with the batter, and then this is what we are going to pour uh, directly into our warm mug uh, for incorporating with the rest of the cocktail. So these are gonna go down at 70 Celsius for however long. All right, here we are. We've got our Tom and Jerry batter that has come out of our sous vide bath and also our milk uh, bag. So I'm actually just gonna place this on top of the bath just to keep it, keep it warm. I've also preheated a coffee mug to keep the drink nice and warm as well. Uh, so we're gonna take our uh, Tom and Jerry batter and pour it into our sous vide bag, or into our uh, ISI whip. Okay. Oh man, that smells awesome. All right. So we're just gonna pour this in here. Okay, and now we're going to go into our whipper with one charge. It might need two. We'll test the texture. I put the deli cup over it because sometimes, sometimes, Mount Vesuvius. We'll give it a good shake. Got a second charge in there just to make it a little bit thicker. It's creamy and delicious, but see if we can get it really nice and foamy. Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking for. It'll incorporate into the drink nicely, but now it kind of holds its shape a little bit. That's exactly what we're looking for. So into our pre-warmed mug we are going to go in with six ounces of milk that's been holding at uh, 70 degrees celsius and you could you could keep this in a, in a mason jar or something with a lid on or like a bottle so that you could pour from it you could do that but i'm not going to into this we're going to go with about two ounces and i'm just going to eyeball it because this stuff tastes delicious Nice, of our Tom and Jerry batter. And then we're gonna do a quart, th uh, three quarters of an ounce each of cognac. Ooh. And rum. Again, going with the Karuba Dark that we used in the batter. And then we've got our bar spoon and we're gonna incorporate that batter 
into the cocktail. And then we're gonna garnish it with fresh nutmeg right over the top. Cheers, folks. Obviously nutmeg on the nose. Let's give it a taste. That's worth the price of admission. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's very rich. It's very rich from the Tom and Jerry batter and from the warm milk, but... It's the holidays in a cup. You've got all those, all those wintry spices, and you've got the rum, and you get this real viscosity to the drink from the, uh, from the batter. I couldn't imagine using warm milk, some pe or warm water. Some people do. Uh, it's, gotta be, it's gotta be the warm milk as far as I'm concerned. This is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Serve this at your holiday gathering, and you've won. You just, you crushed it for the holidays. You need to do nothing else. You won. Yeah. So anyways, that's it. That is the end. There is no more. You ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here. Thank you folks for hanging out with me in my session. I appreciate it. Go make one of these. Cheers, folks. Yeah, and I believe that... That is it. Uh, let's pull up the screen just so everybody, if you want to grab a screen, grab it that or just check it out. But uh, yeah, that, that drink is absolutely phenomenal. The Tom and Jerry, it's like eggnog, but better. I mean, eggnog is delicious too. I have to keep a, keep a bottle of that in my fridge during the holidays. But this one, this one is a real showstopper, especially if you're having people over. Really, really, really delicious and really special. So as I said, that is the end. There is no more. So I will stop sharing. Mike, Jason, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you grab the wheel. Well, that was freaking amazing, Chef. That was, uh, as per usual. It's. Uh, I learned more. I think during your presentation, the rest of the the summit uh, combined. It's just a ridiculous amount of uh, knowledge that you have. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly enjoyed it. I was really happy with that one, and I was uh, when I started. The the, the idea went from here to here really quickly. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I started to think about cocktails and I was just starting to think about all the different things that you can do and the different applications for it. And um, just beyond infusion, because I know we've done stuff on infusions before, um, but just taking it beyond the scope of that. And really the the cordial, the, um, the gum syrup, well, the cordial, the glug, I mean, those kind of fall in, into the category of infusion as well. It's infusion of uh, a syrup in the case of the cordial and stuff, but with the grapefruit, but um, really just kind of expanding the scope of what people, you know, think think about using sous vide for was kind of what I wanted to do. And it looks like uh, people enjoyed it. So, yeah. What was your favorite one when you tried it that uh, you liked the most? Tom and Jerry was really good. Tom and Jerry, I was really looking forward to that. I wanted it to deliver and it certainly did. <laughs> um, also, I think just like the mint, the mint was like really surprising. Like, I, there was, I had 99% certainty it was going to be good. Like <laughs> this should work, right? I, I know this is, I know this works. It should work. But when I tasted it, when I smelled it, wow, man, I think the aromatics out of that were, whew, were super good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We got a lot of good comments. Um, Richard was wondering if you noticed those big flavor differences when you use the two different temperatures or different temperatures in general for coffee. Have you tried that? Uh, no, I haven't tried it against coffee. The only time I've done this cross section. So when I do sous vide classes, um, we'll do uh, a big cross section of different um, temperatures and things and cooking methods and, and all of that uh, for proteins. Uh, but I haven't done it much in the way of sous vide. But it sounds like now I need to. And uh, we should at some point have a session of different ingredients and temperatures and, and really torture test this. Or actually, I'll leave it up to Richard because after doing the uh, coffee infused uh, vermouth that we did, uh, this man went on an, on an infusion binge and uh, did cocoa nibs and all sorts of other things. So maybe I'll leave it up to, uh, to, to other people to do all of the torture testing. <laughs> then you can just take the results and uh, make amazing cocktails with it. <laughs>
Yep. Uh, George had asked, what was the cocktail book you discussed at the very beginning? So that is, uh, so that is Cocktail Codex. So Cocktail Codex is by Alex Day. He also authored um, Death & Co. And his new uh, his newest book is called, I believe, Co Coming Home. Uh, the cocktail, there's a lot of great, if I had to mention, um, some great cocktail books. Uh, uh, Meehan's Bartender's Manual is a must-have. It is a it is an encyclopedic uh, singular book on on modern on classic cocktails, but also just how to execute them, and then everything that goes around it, like building a bar, service. Everything. That book is phenomenal. Definitely get Meehan's bar, Bartender's Manual, um, Cocktail Codex. I reference all the time, all the time. And then if I had to throw in like uh, uh, one more, the Aviary Cocktail Book is great, but I would say uh, regarding cocktails, and I forget the author, I think actually regarding cocktails was a tribute to, shot, to Sasha Petrosky from Milk and Honey uh, in New York. And um, uh, a bunch of his former bartenders wrote a book with their favorite um, cocktails from the bar. That is also another really great really great resource that I reference really frequently. Awesome. Uh, John says he's still loving the toasted coconut Mai Tais that you uh, had presented on. He says, my almonds and coconut budgets have gone up way too far. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, actually, no, I, I was like, I was like almond, almond rum, as the, but he's talking about the, um, he's talking about the, uh, the Orja, but actually almond rum would also be good in that. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Shirley says, fabulous presentation, has a family recipe for the glog, uh, but looking forward to trying your recipe, their recipe sous vide style. So it should be good to have more enhanced flavors. Uh, yeah, so definitely. And uh, we also have, uh, if, you, if anybody has a copy of the book Immersed, uh, we should also give some away uh, throughout the summit. Uh, there's, a, there's another recipe for glug. This recipe that's in here, this is by Anders Ericsson. He's a Chicago-based uh, YouTuber. Um, he used to bartend at one of the best bars in the city called Violet Hour. Uh, and uh, during the pandemic, he started doing YouTube, uh, and that is actually his recipe. But we have a recipe for Glug uh, in the Immersed book that's super awesome as well. It's very, very, very similar. Nice. Some people ask questions about like how long does if you make some of these infusions, how long do they last? Whether it's the mint simple syrup, if it's some of the cordial stuff, how long can you keep that? Yep. And so Mark had, uh, I know Mark was um, chatting up the, the, the comments here uh, and he mentioned, uh, um, you know, back, bacteria and stuff like that, bacterial concerns uh, over certain things, but really um, fresh is better, right? So you're going to, your, your aromas and flavors are going to start to taper off. And just for that reason alone, um, aside of the other concerns, I just wouldn't, uh, I'd say like three to five days. And like when you're making this stuff for a bar, um, you know, you're either some places you make this stuff every day. You just do it every day. And there's a prep team, there's this, and it's just part of your, your normal daily routine. You make it every day. So you're delivering the best possible product to the guest. Um, but at home, you just want to make this stuff at home. It's going to last a couple of days in your fridge. Uh, I've got, I've had the mint in my fridge for about five days now. And I think it's uh, starting to tap out. Not that I'm not going to finish it, but uh, if you really want it to be awesome, I'd say like three to five days. So you're going to be uh, prioritizing cocktails using that over the next day or two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when do you turn to the different, like a one-to-one -one ratio, a two-to-one ratio when it comes to simple syrups? How do you, you talked a little bit about it, but I'm curious just, you know, how do you decide which one's going to work best for a specific type of drink? I almost never use one to one. So that's the answer to that question. So I almost typically use two to one because um, I want to add the, the, you can still deliver the same amount of sweetening that you want to the drink uh, without um, under, you know, you're adding, when you add syrup, you're adding water, you're adding dilution, right? And so if I can do a two to one syrup, I can deliver the same amount of sugar with less water and have less dilution. I mean, the cocktail still has to be balanced in the end, uh, but also uh, doing a two to one syrup is gonna help your uh, your texture, your mouthfeel. Uh, so I typically always do two to one. Rich, simple syrup, like a, a, I almost typically never use a plain, simple syrup. Um, yeah, either I make it taste like something, like I do an infused syrup or something like that, um, or I'll do a grenadine, homemade grenadine with pomegranate, pomegranate molasses. Uh, Orja, it's still syrup, but it's almond syrup. 
um, and that's almond milk and sugar. Uh, old fashioned, they use Demerara syrup. Uh, 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 not a bad, uh, I can't, not an old pal. I'm blanking on it right now, but the, it's an old fashioned uh, with sweetened with Luxardo, uh, which is not a syrup, it's a, it's a liqueur, but um, and typically sweetened with other things that have flavor, agave nectar, uh, right? Or a honey syrup uh, that's just honey diluted with water. So I never typically use just like a 101 simple syrup, uh, but here a 101 in a, uh, in a mint julep works well because you need that dilution. You're using a bonded bourbon, so it's 100 proof, and um, it's a stiff drink. And so uh, it, it dilutes, that drink, it gets better over the course of the drink and using the one-to-one -one syrup for a little bit more dilution. Uh, and that drink is, is called for, for sure. Awesome. One of the reasons we, you know, besides your incredible knowledge that we also like having you on, especially as a sponsor, is that you did an entire presentation and never mentioned any of the actual machines from uh, Bravo Commercial or anything. Do you want to like say what type of things you sell at all uh, since you just gave us an entire hour of uh, ad free, uh, amazing content? You guys have done so much, uh, so much great job of, of, of promoting, you know, promoting the brand, but also just being, you know, just advocates uh, of our equipment. And so many people in the comments have said how much they love Hydro Pro and stuff like that, and Control Freaks. So, you know, thank you to everybody. We work really, really hard on this stuff. Uh, like, really just take it to a different level. Like, uh, the Hydro Pro is in, in development for like four or five years. Like, it's, we really put everything into this. Uh, but yeah, so Rebel Commercial, if you're unaware, uh, we make commercial uh, appliances, but they're also amazing for prosumers as well. Uh, Control Freak is a precise temperature induction hob. Jason's a big fan. Mike's a fan. Use it uh, in one of his sessions. Um, and then the, the Hydro Pro sous vide appliance is arguably one of the best sous vide appliances on the planet. It is completely waterproof. It's got great uh, pumping and heating. It's got all these amazing smart features. It has a Gorilla Glass screen, which I had too much fun with uh, once upon a time trying to break. And I'm <laughs> telling you, you it's it's really robust i was not successful in cracking the screen uh you can actually drop it from like eight feet high and it's pretty much won't break um which is just insane right uh so we make really amazing tools that we put put everything into and right now through the 31st um you can pick up a hydro pro or the 300 series chamber vacuum sealer for 20 percent off at brevelcommercial.com and uh, there's nothing you have to do the discounts apply to check out you'll when you add it to cart you'll see the discounts there Awesome. Perfect. And during the commenting, uh, Mike behind the scenes uh, picks a few winners for a few of the uh, some of the giveaways. So the winner for the Immersed Cookbook, which you helped uh, recipe develop and you helped uh, do a almost all the photography for, I believe, is uh, Dabu Dasgupta. So uh, please uh, send us a note um, at uh, events at the ISVA.org or Mike at the ISVA org. And the winner for the smoking gun is Linda Becker. You didn't even mention the smoking gun and some of the cool smoked avocado and smoked deviled eggs and the things you can do with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can also make a uh, handheld smoker, which is actually our, um, our, our best selling product in terms of uh, units. Like that thing just flies off the shelf. It's a little handheld smoker that you can smoke beverages with uh, soup sides, um, dressings, and pretty much anything with and we'll typically do like smoked guacamole or we'll smoke ricotta cheese for a lasagna. You make smoked ricotta lasagna, like you just, it's, that's, yeah, you, you killed it. Um, it's really delicious. So yeah, the smoking gun is one of our, is one of our favorite appliances. Well, Chef, thank you so much for giving such an amazing presentation. Uh, please give him some love in the comments and congrats again on uh, getting into the sous vide hall of fame. I was rooting for you, but I didn't need to give any pushing because everyone was just like, well, yeah, of, of course he needs to go in right away. So it was, uh, I was, it was nice to see some of the people that I highly respect in the industry also want to uh, acknowledge you and you're uh, one of the top vote getters for uh, you're on almost everyone's ballot. So it was nice to see that. That flabbergasted me. I just, I, I, you know, I just, I don't get it. Uh, but I'm very much humbled and, and appreciated. Well, thank you very much, sir. Appreciated the uh, presentation and uh, look forward to uh, the next time we chat, which hopefully will be soon. Oh, well, we have tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I was hoping. Yeah. I can't remember what the schedule is because Mike uh, put everything together like the madman that he is. So, uh, yeah. 
tomorrow grab bag oh grab bag that's right yes looking forward to uh the grab bag uh tomorrow all you are going to enjoy watching some of these people get uh, an ingredient thrust their way and have to uh make the most out of it that they can it should be an amazing time so thank you so much for chef Petransic for doing that it was amazing um a few people in the comments are talking about the uh the smoker uh, the uh, uh, the hand smoker Richard makes uh, smoked ice for cocktails, which is a great way to do it. I've done uh, a few smoked cocktail recipes on my blog where you can uh, smoke the glass or smoke the shaker, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with it. Serve it with a little uh, plate on the top, take it off, and then the smoke kind of wafts up into people. Um, and then Mike also asked, any thoughts on the MX2? Um, I can find the link when I'm not uh, yammering at you, but we did a interview with Chef Petransic when the MX2 sealer came out and did an entire demo of it. It's an hour long, uh, basically running through everything that it does. So I'll, I'll pass that along, Mike, so you can check that out uh, when we get off the air today. But it's a really good look at everything you would want to know about the, the MX2. So thank you very much to Chef Petransic for doing that. And we're going to move on to the next presentation.